So um, this session um, hopefully will give you uh, uh, some insight into the kinds of things that students have been doing um, in studying the, uh, uh, the, the course um, Economy, Society and Public Policy. Um, I just want to start by uh, putting uh, uh, the e-book, this course, into the context of the other uh, materials that, that CORE has produced. Um, as has been said, uh, uh, um, this, this, this whole project started um, six or seven years ago, I think six years of, of production since we first started writing. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that uh, it benefits from two things, especially. One is fantastic leadership from Wendy Carlin and Sam Bowles, without which it would not have happened. Um, but the second is the, the momentum and the enthusiasm that comes from involving huge numbers of people who really want to make this work around the world. Um, and there are some pictures there on, this, uh, on the slide um, of economists um, in London, um, Paris, uh, Bangalore, Siena, um, there are many, many places, not only where CORE is being used, but the economists um, in those universities were part of producing uh, these materials. Um, and the first thing, uh, the thing that uh, 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 that huge group of people began with uh, about six years ago um, was to produce uh, the, the, uh, the e-book, The Economy. Um, and the plan was ambitious. Um, to, to revolutionize introductory courses for undergraduate economists. Um, and this stemmed, uh, as Andy Haldane talked about at the beginning, from some of the, 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 the discontent um, after the financial crisis that students felt with what they were learning uh, in economics courses, but also the, uh, um, the, the lack of satisfaction that many university teachers of economics uh, felt about what they were doing and how they were doing it. So the idea, um, the ideas behind uh, uh, the, the, the kind of the teaching economics ideas um, behind the production of the economy, which was very much initially focused on uh, first year uh, uh, undergraduate students, was to, to interest them and to involve them in studying economics, in studying the economy, um, by focusing on what they observed around them, on, on the uh, evidence on the economy from, the, from around the world, from uh, 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 over long, over millennia uh, of evidence uh, of, of how economies have developed, uh, to start with that, to ask students to look around them and to ask questions about how, to, how can we explain uh, what we see. So asking questions first, trying to understand things, and then introducing models, economic models and tools, to help answer them. So models are not just things that we present to students to say, this is how the world is. They look at the models and they say, what? That is not how the world is. The models that you will learn if you study the, 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 uh, the economy um, through this course, um, are, it's about developing models to help you find answers to the interesting questions. Um, it absolutely teaches the standard tools of economics. Uh, uh, um, it's been criticized from the opposite side uh, by people who feel it's not radical enough. They are there. Uh, students learn constrained optimization, but the focus throughout is on showing how they give insight into real world problems. And one of the things that the economy did was to set economics in a much broader context than it, used, than it had been before in uh, uh, university courses. The social, political, ethical context in which we think about economic questions. So expanding the, the boundaries of the subject uh, for our students. But why stop there? Um, an understanding of the economy um, as has been said already this afternoon, should not be restricted to the, the few people who choose to study economics at university. And uh, the people involved in producing the economy uh, realized, I think, that having taken economics out beyond its, uh, the, the kind of narrow confines about, of what had been taught in universities before, um, this was something that could equally be accessible to people who didn't particularly want to study economics as a subject, but who needed the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, tools of economic analysis, the insights that economics could offer, because they want to understand society and how it works to uh, uh, understand the societal problems. So that brings us to the kind of the second big stage of the project, 
which is ESPP, the Economy, Society and Public Policy. Uh, and what that does is to take some of the materials, many of, those, many of the things that are in uh, ESPP are also in the economy, takes the central topics and materials and the policy questions especially uh, and makes them accessible to, uh, to a wider audience. And the kinds of problems that uh, people who study ESPP will be looking at, inequality, financial instability, climate change, wealth creation, innovation, are questions of interest well beyond those uh, 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 who expected to be spending three years studying economics at university. So moving on from the economy, the, uh, the, the kind of second big phase was the development uh, with the help of the Nuffield Foundation of the ESPP course. Um, and the idea was to take those materials and make them accessible to a wider audience, uh, accessible and non-mathematical. I don't think those are the same things. I don't think things have to be non-mathematical to be accessible, uh, um, and non-mathematical things are not necessarily accessible. But hopefully uh, uh, ESPP is both. It uh, uh, gives an accessible introduction to economic ideas um, and again is based on this idea that we take the world as we see it and address real and important policy questions and we develop the tools that you need to answer them. And alongside that, very much uh, uh, um, as part of um, the mission uh, 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 given us by the, the Nuffield Foundation um, and uh, uh, in keeping with the focus on evidence, um, the uh, 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 the companion data projects, which uh, um, developed as a sequence which can either be used separately uh, or together with the ESPP course doing economics, actually enable students to take real data and analyze it for themselves, and as they're doing that, to acquire uh, uh, the quantitative skills uh, um, that um, all social scientists and informed citizens perhaps uh, need to understand the economy and society. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, uh, what the students um, at Stirling uh, 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 make of this and what they've been learning. And I'm going to, to um, hand over, uh, uh, first of all, to Paul Powell, is that right, Paul? Um, and uh, who's going to introduce them. Well, what auspicious surroundings. I just want to start by saying something on a personal note. I was once here on a school trip 13 years ago to get a talk at the Bank of England, presented by Janet. And it's strange how things are circular in economics, but also in life sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd start off with that on a personal note. Um, thank you for inviting us here, Wendy and Cohen. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. But as much as a privilege this is, and it is a privilege, it's an even greater privilege to give economics learning and teaching to students. That is the greatest privilege that I have as an economist, not in research, as well as research, but also in learning and teaching. So CORE and ESPP has really revolutionized and kind of energized that way of teaching for me. Um, when I asked, could I introduce it, or when it was mooted with my head of department, could we introduce it? Um, the response was yes. And now from September 20 and 21 at Sterling, it'll be used across as standard. All our inter introductory undergraduate and postgraduate teaching, which serves as a warning to not give me permission to do something, because I'll do it. Um, I basically tried to get it in as fast as possible. Uh, I first met Wendy in June last year at the core conference and I just basically tried to get core and ESVP in as soon as possible because it's such it addresses such a need for the students um, so it's being used core is being used for our MSc at Sterling currently and ESPP is being used with the students that are here today on the MSc business and management degree program and it really is a testament to core and its approach and using ESPP to how quickly it can be introduced. I mean, I just ripped up the um, syllabus uh, with a month and a half before students were about to be sitting a class. So uh, that tells you something about how quickly you can adopt this in a really comprehensive way. So why core? Why would we choose to be one of the 40 universities in the UK using it? Well, because 
we think it really does address all of those challenges that we, we see. That we've had a long-term interest in selling from this from afar, myself included, and really it, 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 it addresses the idea of we need to react to how the world is changing. This institution that we're currently sitting in, some of us standing, um, knows too well that the world has changed so much in such a little amount of time. So we need to be able to be proactive in what we teach, how we teach it, and also why we're teaching it. So for me, I would like to be teaching students to be preparing them in all good faith for what's going to be happening in maybe 5, 10, 20 years' time, not what's been happening in the past 30 years. Also, for me, because I'm really interested in trying to teach in different ways, um, core is perfect for that, because it means you can flip the syllabus as well as the, as the classrooms. You can do lots of games and experiments, um, as some of my students might attest to. And I think on a personal note as well, previously when I was teaching without the core approach, and I still do teach the traditional some stuff, um, I tend to use the phrase, but in the real world, often. And I find that quite disheartening, that I'm doing all of this teaching and learning and presenting all these models, but then I have to say, great, you've understood it, but in the real world. And that's just, it breaks my heart. So I think with core, you start with the real world. The real world drives the curriculum, rather than trying to fit something to make, to, to, rather than to, to take something to make it fit the real world. So in terms of our students, previously they were doing 12 hours. It's a very short course, so my students are here. Uh, they were doing a very short course in economics. They had no choice to do it, but some have done it before, some have done it, um, some have never done it before. Um, they would previously do a very traditional approach of supply and demand and price elasticities and market power and lots, of, lots and of, of time spent on perfect competition. Um, so this year, very different. We start by talking about inequality and capitalism and the real world that we're, we're in, talking about real firms and the, the relationship between the employer and the employee in terms of the power dynamic, um, and really just trying to address the real world social dilemmas that exist. So for me, the ESPP approach really is a perfect fit for these types of situations. And I just want to finish very quickly on the bit of feedback, because as we all know, doing something new for the first time can be quite uh, dangerous, it could be quite uh, scary. And I was a, bit, a little bit unsure, being honest, of how it would be received by students. And the feedback that I got from one student to say that, you know, I started doing economics at school, ended up hating it, saw it on the syllabus for this course, this degree, and now I love it again. It found, it rekindled that love for economics. And if we're going to be sending out graduates into the, the world to try and address the very important public policy problems, then we need to keep that love for economics going. So I'd like to hand over to my students, if that's okay. And thank you very much. So hello everyone, um, thank you Paul for the introduction and thank you all for having us here. So uh, my name is Anya and together with my classmates um, Asan, Ma and Kriti, we're going to talk about our reflection and study in studying with the core approach in today's presentation. So uh, we are business and management master students at the University of Stirling coming from all over the world. Um, in our first semester, the course included a module in economics. Um, right at the beginning of the module, it became clear that it was not the traditional way of teaching economics, but it was something special. So now we understand that it was about, uh, it was the ESPP approach, um, which created a, a completely different study environment. Thus, although we are from different cultural backgrounds with various experiences in studying economics, we all agree that ESPP opened up a new and better perspective on economics. So after this little introduction, um, the presentation will cover the following topics. 
As some of us already um, studied economic theories before, we are going to talk about the cross-references between old experiences and studying the ESPP core approach. Moreover, we are going to talk about the initial benefits we gained from ESPP. After that, we will be giving you a link to real-world examples where ESPP helped us to understand reality better. In the end, the conclusion will give a summary of our findings. So, um, yes. studying with ESPP. So, our cross-references, and I'm going to start with our past experiences. Before I came to Sterling um, and saw economics on the economics module in the degree timetable, I wasn't looking forward to it because this um, module, um, I expected this module to be exactly like the economics module I had in my undergrad study. These pictures on the slide are literally what I had in mind when I saw economics on my course outline. During my past studies, I needed to know, to know all these equations and the math behind it perfectly separated into two courses, one from microeconomics and the other one from macroeconomics, instead of just teaching a comprehensible theory. And when we exchanged our past experiences within the group, it was not only me who had this view on economics in mind. Everyone who has studied economic theory before had the same experiences and expectations. And when we, um, therefore, most of the learning outcomes from our past studies were based on math, and the ideas and concepts were mainly theory oriented. Moreover, most of the graphs and examples which were taught were really difficult to understand and had no link to real world happenings. So, however, when we started our economics module here, the content of teaching was immediately better than we expected because it was based on the ESPP core approach. It was clear that the focus was on understanding the matter and not on teaching just mathematical equations. And above all, we appreciated the fact that we were given a context of the, great, uh, of the big picture instead of thinking in theories. Through the digital platform uh, with insights of great economists and the interactive graphs and quizzes, ESPP addresses the theory in an understandable way. Moreover, the usage of current and historical events, such as inequality, climate change, and financial instability, uh, with the help of real-world examples, made us feel engaged with the topics and helped us to understand complex issues more clearly. So thus, ESPP creates a work environment where students feel empowered to do their own research. And um, they link their knowledge to familiar situations. Kriti now will continue to outline how these experiences, will, um, how these experiences were applied to our everyday lives and in what ways we gained initial benefits from ESPP. Thank you. Thanks, Anya. The ESPP approach helps build a clear base for understanding each concept. There has been a shift from stating theories and hypotheses to application. The first example that I would like to mention is the concept of self-interest and social dilemmas I learned from the I learned, and the reason for, oh, sorry, through the application of the concept of self-interest and social dilemmas, I learned the reason for the pollution across the border of US and Mexico, which is the self-interested uh, preferences of both the regions. This improved my ability to understand the global affairs. In the past few decades, the environmental issues have surpassed na national boundaries and transformed into international issues with the deepening economic interdependence among countries and rapid economic and social transformations. The economy of the two regions with a shared environment enters a power, in, environmental poverty trap featured by both lower environmental quality and shorter life expectancy. The social dilemma of both the regions of not maintaining the environment is due to a lack of awareness about the costs of not maintaining the environment, like shorter life expectancy, which leads to lower human capital. 
Awareness about these factors is enough to counter this social dilemma. Now, I would like to uh, mention the second example, which is the concept of consumer preferences. This concept has been illustrated through the relationship between the free time a student chooses to have and the final grade they receive. So here on the graph, uh, for a given grade, I preferred a combination with more free time to one with less free time. Therefore, even though both A and B correspond to a grade of 84, I will prefer A because it gives me more free time. Similarly, if there are two combinations and both have 20 hours of free time, I would prefer the one with a higher grade. Mm -hmm. Now, the concept of utility has also been made clear through this example. Suppose I say that I am indifferent between A and D, meaning I would feel equally satisfied with either outcome. So we say that these two outcomes would give me the same utility. These combination of preferences are then joined to form a downward sloping indifference curve. This example is very personal as I enjoyed the process of interconnecting the willingness to give up free time for a better grade to this concept of utility and further being able to illustrate that with the help of a diagram. It's quite interesting to be able to see that as we move left on the indifference curve, it becomes steeper and that it is the marginal rate of uh, substitution increases. So I went I went an hour of extra, I got, I want an hour of extra free time. If I want an hour of extra free time, I just have to sacrifice nine great points, which seems like a fair deal to me since my preferred grade is already pretty high. <laughs> Thank you. I would like now, now I would like to bridge to Ma. Hello everyone, my name is Ma. Uh, <gasps> since I'm from China, as you can see, so I'm going to explore Yeah, I'm going to explore one specific uh, real-world example, which is a trade war between China and the United States. In 2018, Trump formally signed a memorandum of the trade with China in the White House. He announced that it is possible to impose, um, impose some tariffs about, uh, six, uh, about $539 billion of goods imported from China and restrict Chinese enterprises' investment at the same time in the U.S. And uh, to fight back, um, China decided to impose 25% uh, of tariff um, of about $120 billion of goods originating in the U.S. Before I study the ESPP core approach <coughs> based on the truth of this trade war, I may think why the two countries do not conduct a friendly cooperation to each other. But this view only stays on the surface. And after I study the core approach, I can see some natures only a little behind uh, this phenomenon. And uh, um, this trade war itself is a good example of the prisoner's dilemma. Here is the assumption I made based on this trade war. So it can be predicted that uh, if both of China and the U.S. choose to cooperate, they will have a higher payoff, but not the highest. And if they choose to impose tariffs, they will have a lower payoff. Assuming that they both cooperate, each of them will have a payoff of five. And if one chooses to cooperate and another one chooses to impose tariffs, the cooperative one will have a payoff of zero, and the other one will have a payoff of seven. If they both impose tariffs, they will have a payoff of two. So in this game, both China and the U.S. have their dominant strategies. The dominant strategy for China is imposing tariffs. And similarly, um, the United States' dominant strategy is imposing tariffs. So sadly, it seems like this trade war will never end. However, this is not a one-shot game because um, Punishment can be given to the free riders, and uh, extra, extra reward can be given to the, uh, the other player. So in this case, um, assume, the, uh, assume that there is an invisible power which can force the player to hand over half of its payoff if it chooses to impose tariffs. And the other player can obtain that half payoff if it chooses to cooperate. Then the metrics will uh, change to the numbers within the, uh, within the buckets. 
So the 70 and the 07 will change to 3.5 and 3.5. In this case, both China and the United States will change their dominant strategy to cooperation. And such punishment uh, did uh, really exist uh, during the trade war, mm, such as mm, the United States uh, accepted the consequences that the EU and uh, Canada both imposed tariffs on its goods. And as shown as in this figure, the United States mm, faced its largest trade deficit with China of about $419 billion in 2018. So as I explained uh, this example, uh, it is a really good example uh, to explain the prisoner's dilemma, but that is not the main purpose. The main purpose of, the, of showing this example is to show the change of the, of the way that we think after learning the ESPP core approach. And uh, this change is that in the future, when we face problems, we can not only stay on the surface, but also be able to deeply uh, explore the answers behind the surface. Now let Ashan introduce another example. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, this is um, another example how uh, the core approach um, helped us to better understand a social event. Um, it took a um, lot of headlines recently when um, Thomas Cook uh, collapsed. Um, and um, it actually it was a, a, a terrible situation where uh, about 600,000 people were stranded and 21,000 people, uh, employees, uh, were unemployed. And um, um, as I said, it was, it was very disastrous. Uh, but at the same time, we saw another news headlines where uh, Glasgow-based um, a company called Bahit Travels coming to rescue um, these, most of these uh, uh, blade off or, or, or redundant staff. Um, so now we have to see um, the relationship between these two scenarios. Um, why did Bahed came to rescue them? What are the benefits that they get out of uh, this action? Um, are they just being uh, good Samaritans who want to help out Thomas Cook staff who's laid off and they want to just get them back to or rehire them back to their company? Or is it they just want to tap into the lucrative Thomas Cook customer base by hiring the staff back to the Bahed Travels? So these are the questions that um, went through our minds when we read this news and the headlines. And this is when actually the understanding or the learning or the knowledge from the core approach really help us to um, disintegrate these kind of headlines and news and understand them better. So the topics we covered, for example, the wages, uh, the competition or profits or um, uh, even the labor models actually covered theoretically um, uh, gave a very good theoretical coverage for these kind of scenarios. And also the illustrations, the models, and um, the curves actually provided a, a very good practical platform for us to uh, apply these kind of situations in, in real life situations. Um, so basically, as a summary, uh, what we learned from, uh, from the ESP Core approach helped us to uh, develop new perspectives on decoding social news and also understanding objectives and benefits of economic decisions, and also use of underlying theories to evaluate a situation much simpler and a very structured manner. Um, so with that, I will uh, pass to Kriti to our conclusion. Thanks, Ashan. Our overall experience with ESPP has been that we believe it is an excellent resource for learning economic principles. It gave insights into specialist areas and analytical tools. Also, we gained a greater understanding of politics and policy through accessible yet comprehensive introduction of economic ideas. The relevance of economics has been rekindled the way it used to be at the time of John Maynard Keynes and Adam Smith. So to conclude, we don't see the world the same way after ESPP.
Thank you very much. Um, and, and, uh, hello, everyone. Um, and I'm already thinking back to actually with the last slide that Wendy showed of the, the, the bar chart of the audience. And there was that tiny little thing at the bottom of private sector. So um, yes, I'm from the private sector, um, which I must admit, I don't know whether it was Wendy's sense of humor to suggest that let's get a banker in to talk about um, the role that economics can play in terms of public purpose. Um, but we can, um, even um, working um, for an investment bank. Um, obviously, what I do as, as a chief economist for a bank, I spend a lot of my time talking to people that work in financial markets. Most of them, to be honest, really just want to know when's the next interest rate move in whatever country um, and what's the impact going to be and how can they um, make money. Um, so it's really interesting hearing a lot of the discussion about core and how it is about how it operates in the real world um, and also I think making it accessible and I should say as someone that was a student of Wendy's um, when she first joined UCL in the late 1980s she, she always looked at the world in a much more applied sense so I, I can't remember a lot of what I learned in my undergraduate but I definitely remember macroeconomic policy in Western Europe um, that became very useful when I was a European economist um, I also remember a lot about comparative economic systems, um, although clearly Russia's gone in a different direction since then. Um, so what I want to do is, is obviously congratulate the students on their excellent um, presentation, um, but rather than talk specifically about the issue that they talked about, I wanted to, to touch on the income inequality um, issue, um, because it's been raised a lot already in, in the progress of this discussion. Um, we talk about it um, in economics um, because it does matter. It, it matters in terms of populism, nationalism. Um, it's played a role in the trade wars. It also is a broader macroeconomic issue for growth. So really what I want to do is think about some of the issues they've raised and are raised in some of the other issues and also how we present those issues in economic data. So I want to skim through a few charts that I use um, that hopefully you'll find interesting because it puts a lot of these concepts um, into some charts that hopefully are accessible to non um, economists. So obviously I'm intimidated in this room of academic economists um, because this is something um, that really just uses data, I think, in a historical context, in a global context, um, and also in pictures um, that people will understand. Because first of all, it is the point that I often make, which is that economic inequality, uh, sorry, economic inequality has become a much more pressing issue in the last decade, but it is not a new issue. It's been evident since the 90s. 1970s in all regions of the world, nor is it just an advanced world issue, it's become an increasingly pressing issue in emerging markets like China as well. And in some countries it hasn't actually deteriorated since the crisis, it's just that the impact has become much more apparent, uh, both in terms of wealth, but also when the pie is growing a lot less quickly, people feel the relative disparities in a much more pressing way. And I think that's been the situation in the UK um, in particular. The other point um, that often comes a lot, up a lot in this world is, has been a very job-rich recovery, but has also been a, a, a wage-poor um, recovery is the issue um, of differences in wage growth and in contributions um, to income. So these are two of the charts that I tend to use to, to present this point. And obviously this is a criticism that's often put to central banks, that central banks, and I'm sure Andy Haldane hears this on a regular basis when he goes around the country, which is that central banks are adding to income inequality. Monetary policy has not added to income inequality. It has contributed to wealth inequality because we've seen obviously a much bigger increase in, in house prices and in um, equity prices, although obviously equity prices have fallen in the last few days in view of the coronavirus, um, but you get the general idea from that chart. And so when you look at different income groups in the United States, um, when you look at the, um, the lowest 25% um, um, of the population, they rely very heavily 
on, on obviously wage incomes, and typically they tend to be lower skilled people that have seen lower wage increases, um, and also more in the way of transfer payments, but at higher income people are getting more of their income coming through from the asset price um, returns. And we also see it um, in terms, therefore, of the savings rates. And, you know, there's been a lot to discuss. Um, obviously, the students talked about trade wars um, in particular. That's kept us very busy over the course of the last year. It's played a big role in terms of investment spending. Currently, it's all about the coronavirus. But back in 2018, a lot of the discussion was about the impact of these um, Donald Trump-led tax cuts um, and the way in which they were using public policy um, to try to revive the economy. So this, I think, is quite an interesting way of showing this income inequality issue, and I suppose this does feed through into their point regarding um, consumer preferences and ability to save. I think it brings home quite clearly that for the bottom 80%, 80% of the US population, their household savings rate is effectively zero, um, whereas for the top 1%, it is ne nearly 50%. So when we're thinking about how these tax cuts were going to feed through to the economy, no surprises at all that the multiplier effect of a tax cut that was heavily skewed towards higher earners was not going to have a particularly big impact um, on the US. Um, economy. So yes, this is already a political issue. I think it's already played a role um, in some of the um, election of much more populist and nationalistic governments that we've seen um, around the world because of that marginal propensity to consume point, um, but also um, various studies by the OECD um, and others have shown the direct impact on economic growth if you do get, um, a, 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 I suppose, a deterioration or, or an improvement in terms of the likes of the Gini coefficient, but also it impacts when we're thinking about the growth outlook going forward. And this is quite difficult to quantify in real time, but in terms of how we bring this into our analysis in the real world, to use um, Paul's um, term, um, it is thinking about the relative rankings um, of different countries and where we are likely to see um, some pressure points coming through, because obviously in an unequal world, you see a lot less in the way of social and physical mobility, um, a lack of social cohesion. I mean, there's that point there about suboptimal policy. You know, we look around the world, there's a very clear geographical divide, for instance, in the UK. Uh, the regions of the UK that voted for Brexit are the regions of the UK, so basically England outside London and Wales, um, that have been left behind by globalisation, but also who potentially are going to be most affected by leaving um, the EU. Um, similarly, in the US, the people that voted for Donald Trump's much more protectionist policies, the likes of Michigan, and who voted for the ripping up of the NAFTA agreement, rely on China, uh, sorry, on Canada and Mexico to sell 75% of their cars. So all of this income inequality and lack of access to education and social and physical mobility feeds through into um, a weaker growth outlook. And it's going to be particularly pressing in the coming years because of technology. And again, just to give you an idea of, of how we think about this and the different ways in which we use new types of data, um, it's not all necessarily scientific, um, but should you be interested, um, I haven't got eco economists on there, but it gives you an idea of the level of automation risk, I suppose, by education level, um, based on whether you've got a high school education um, or some post-secondary education or a bachelor's degree um, or beyond. And it won't surprise you to see that education um, is vitally important. Um, should you be interested in economists, apparently we have a 43% chance of being automated, um, but that's pretty good. If you were a call centre employee, it would be a lot higher than that. If you really want to know, um, if you don't want to be an economist, um, although I would strongly recommend that most of us stay in the profession, you really want to be a hairdresser or a dentist. Um, they are not the most easily um, automatable one. So, 
yes, there is a clear role for public policy to come through here. This isn't something that's going to be resolved just by a couple of years of strong growth. We look globally. Um, I mentioned that we rate countries in terms of their growth potential based on what's happening in a number of these areas. I'm sure you're all familiar um, with the different factors that can support inclusive growth and can support growth potential and that may eventually get it into a higher interest rate world if we can see productivity improvements coming through on the back of it. Um, but the fact is, when we look around the world, either incumbent governments um, have to deliver it um, or we are going to see um, the election of alternative governments um, that will be put in place on the promises um, of delivering um, something else. Um, that really, uh, I suppose, just, just emphasises that um, the importance of what you've been talking about from a core perspective, the applied nature of the course, the different ways of using data, um, and examining these, these much broader issues rather than a purely theoretical world, um, is, is absolutely, even in the, the, the dark arts of investment banking, is something that economists such as myself are using on a daily basis when we're thinking beyond what Andy and his colleagues on the MPC are going to be doing at the next meeting. So thank you very much and thank you again to the students. Thank you very much. Um, I was interested about the examples that um, you said you were particularly interested in. Um, where did they come from? Was it something that the students decide upon or the lecturers? In terms of the examples that we used in the presentation? Um, just and generally as well. Yeah. And generally. I try and make it as open as possible. I, I don't want to be prescriptive into um, what students should be thinking about. Um, I'm happy to guide students, but really in terms of even the, the assessment that the students did, I opened up to say, think about any social dilemma you can think of, but make sure it's a real one, and think about real solutions to that problem. That way that um, it instills that idea of making sure that students can try to formulate the, the, the problem and try and create new solutions to the existing ideas. That's my approach. Thank you very much. Any other? My question is for Wendy. You talked about you want the 300,000 women back, and you, s you said it was a back of an envelope number, but were they ever there in the first place if we're getting them back? Well, we or do we want to find them? Yeah, we want to find them. We okay. want to, uh, yeah, we want to get them as economists, um, and we want to get them back from other subjects. So people often say that it's somehow because of uh, maths that uh, we've lost these women from economics. It's absolutely not true. And Sarah uh, and Andrew in the final, the last session are going to come back to that question. So thanks for... Quick recording. fire question for the students. Really quickly, when did you hear the word economics and think, yeah, that's for me? What was that moment in your childhood that took you to uni to do economics? <laughs> <laughs> They're doing business. <laughs> no, it's a yeah. business degree, but Amy, you did economics before, didn't you? Um, yeah, well, during my undergrad, I had um, the same major, so basically business and um, management, but um, I always had some modules in economics. At school? Uh, yeah, in, the, in my university in Germany. My what, what, oh, so you didn't do economics at uni, yeah. you've had modules in economics and yeah, then that took yeah. you to your masters, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a module, not our major. Yeah. Have any of the others of you studied economics before this course? I have studied economics before um, and the, the approach has always been very theoretical, so it never piqued my interest much. 
but coming here, like with the core approach, I was able to really engage with it. And I was, on an honest basis, I was really bad at economics before, and it was very surprising that I was able to improve and, like, you know, do well in it. Mom, what would you like to say? Yeah, I, I had never you know, got involved in any economic issues before, before I came here. So uh, my former <coughs> major is uh, automatic technology, it's doing with math. Uh, although it's uh, something sim similar to the economics, but I had never heard that before. So it is uh, far away from me, that is a word, far away from me, like uh, Britain is far away from my home. Yeah, um, I studied uh, economics in, uh, when I was doing my bachelor's in, in, in Singapore Management University uh, in a very competitive environment. Um, well, it has always, uh, my perception about um, economics has always been it's very analytical, very technical uh, kind of a subject. And um, even after I finished my bachelor's degree, it didn't change. And it didn't change um, until I, I, I came to uh, do this degree, uh, this master's degree. Um, Still, economics is not my fav most favorite subject, I would say, <laughs> but um, it actually um, changed the perspective of how I look at economics. That's the only difference that I um, experience by learning um, it in a very practical and very applicable uh, way. But um, the fact remains the same in my belief that it, it requires quite a lot of analytical and um, technical skills to um, excel in this uh, subject. Uh, um, so I'll, I think we'll, we'll stop there and uh, thank the students again for their questions.